Hey everybody, I'm Justin Cook, and although we're still very early in the year, I think the movie gods may have already gifted us with one of the craziest, most bonkers, strangest movies of 2019, and that movie is Serenity. Not that Serenity, that one. In this video, I'm going to explain the plot and ending of what is no doubt a movie that will leave people with a lot of questions, primarily which movie executive who makes a six, seven figure salary greenlit this absolutely wild, messy, uh, honestly insanely watchable film. And before I dive into spoilers, I just want to say that there's a twist in this movie that in hindsight will probably join the likes of The Number 23 and The Happening, among the strangest movie twists of all time. So if you want to see that for yourself, go out, see the movie, then come back to this video. But if you have no interest, uh, just blind curiosity in the movie, or have seen it and want further clarification, then let's jump into it. So Serenity follows a man named Baker Dill, played by Matthew McConaughey, who lives on a fishing island called Plymouth, where he works as a fisherman who occasionally takes people out on his boat to catch tuna. Oh yeah, and his boat is named Serenity, hence the name of the movie. Baker Dill, however, an Iraq war veteran who receives strange visions and clearly has a mysterious past, lives a bit of a lonely life and is consumed by his desire to catch a large tuna that he calls Justice. And at the beginning of the movie, attempts to do so alongside Duke, played by Jaiman Hansu, another island inhabitant. It's also worth mentioning that the island Plymouth is a very small community where word gets around fast and pretty much everybody knows what everybody else is doing at all times. Baker Dill is strapped for cash and makes money on the side by sleeping with Diane Lane's character Constance. As Baker Dill claims, he is a hooker who can't afford hooks, a real quote from the movie. Before Baker leaves, he asks Constance about her son who has moved away in Miami and used to help Baker on his boat and says that whenever he wants to come back, he'd love to give him work on his boat. Through all this, Baker is pursued by Jeremy Strong's character, a businessman named Reed Miller, who is from a fishing company called Fontaine and wants to have a word with Baker. The plot starts chugging away when Baker's ex-wife Karen, played by Anne Hathaway, manages to find Baker on the island who has changed his name from John after not seeing each other for years, and Karen makes a request. Also, quick side note, unless I miss something, this movie expects us to believe that Anne Hathaway and McConaughey are the same age, which is a tad bit of a stretch, but uh, moving on. It's revealed that Karen left Baker for a rich man named Frank, Jason Clark's character, who is all around an awful guy and frequently abusive to submissive Karen. Karen and Baker also now have a 13-year-old son together, a gifted boy named Patrick who lives with Karen and Frank and locks himself in his room every day, hiding away from his abusive father, playing on his computer. Karen's request is as follows. Frank will be joining Karen for a vacation on the island shortly, and she wants Baker to take him out on his boat, get him drunk, and drop him in the ocean for the sharks. In return, Karen says she will give Baker $10 million in cash. Baker rejects Karen's request and sends her away. Through all this, Baker has a strong telepathic connection with his son, who is shown in his room on his computer and communicating with his father. So Karen's husband Frank arrives on the island, and after Baker first refuses to take him out on the boat, eventually Frank wears him down, claiming that every man has his price, and Baker, Duke, and Frank go for a regular fishing trip where, yeah, Frank proves himself to be quite the asshole. On the boat, Frank, who of course has no idea that Baker is Karen's ex-husband and Patrick's father, talks about his dislike for Patrick and how he hates that Patrick spends most of his time playing a fishing simulation game on his computer. He reveals that after confronting the boy once, Patrick claimed that if he weren't playing the fishing game, he would kill Frank himself. After the trip and hearing the way Frank talks about his son, Baker tells Karen that he agrees to her terms and will kill Frank when he takes him out on his boat again to catch tuna the next day. Now this is where the movie, about two thirds of the way through, completely gets flipped on his head and doesn't just jump the shark but does a couple dozen somersaults over it. Baker arrives home to find that the businessman who has been chasing him down the whole film, Reed Miller, is outside his living space, which is a shipping container, by the way, and the two have a chat. Reed claims that he can give Baker the one thing he's always wanted and opens his suitcase to reveal a state-of-the-art fish finder, which he can use to catch Justice, the big tuna that he's been after for no discernible reason the entire film. Reed offers it to Baker for free, and Baker's immediately suspicious, and made even more so when Reed tells Baker that he knows his intentions to kill Frank on a fishing trip. Baker gets physical with Reed, and Reed says he is, quote, just playing my part in the game. Baker questions what game, and Reed goes on to divulge the big shocking twist that everything on Plymouth is a game, that someone made a world on their computer, and that the creator's favorite game has been Catch the Tuna, which Baker has been programmed to do. At this point in the movie, it can be assumed that the game was created by Baker's son Patrick, and is the video game that several characters reference in playing throughout the film, which would imply that Baker exists in a digital world. Reed, who is the rule master of sorts in this game, and is programmed to keep Baker on track in catching the fish, 
notices that the primary objective of the game has now changed to killing Frank, which he disapproves of and begs Baker to stay on track and catch the fish. Baker is left confused by this interaction and wakes up the next day unsure of if it ever really happened and begins questioning his reality. As he prepares to get ready for his boat trip with Frank, each Plymouth resident he comes across attempts to keep him on track of catching the fish, making the audience question if this is because they have been programmed to keep Baker from killing Frank, or if word of Baker's intentions legitimately spread around the island and they're trying to stop him from making a potentially life-ruining mistake. Baker even comes across Constance's son, who claims that he's back to help Baker on the boat, although Baker declines his offer. Duke also hires men to break Frank's hand to prevent him from going on the fishing trip in the first place, but Karen convinces Frank to go on the trip regardless of his injury. Baker's son communicates to his father through the game, and Baker decides to follow his son's orders and kill his stepfather. So now we enter the final 20 minutes of the movie, Baker, Karen, and an extremely beaten down and drunk Frank go out on the boat together, and as Baker is beginning his plot to kill Frank, Constance's son pops out, saying that he was on the boat the whole time to help Baker catch the tuna, meaning that he now needs to stage Frank's death to make it seem like an accident, which admittedly is a really minor inconvenience in the plot that exists for no other reason than to add just slightly more drama. Baker gets a tug on his fishing wire from what he believes is the big tuna Justice, the one he's been chasing the whole movie, attaches the rod to Frank, and the rod's force from being hooked to the tuna sends Frank flying into the ocean to his death, achieving the game and his son's objective. Yeah, so got all that? Because there's a little bit more. After all this happens, we hear a news broadcast that takes place in the real world, not the digital world that Patrick created, that clarifies things a bit more. The newscaster says that Patrick is sent to a juvenile detention center on a charge of second degree murder for taking a knife and stabbing his stepfather Frank during one of his abusive fits. Karen is quoted on the newscast saying that her son acted in self-defense, as her and her son have been victims of domestic violence at the hands of Frank for many years. It's further revealed that Patrick is in fact a gifted IT student who withdrew into a world he created on his computer, and that his real father John, aka the man we know in the virtual world as Baker Dill, was killed in action in Iraq in 2006 and awarded the Purple Heart for his actions. Consequences for Patrick don't sound too awful, as it's said that he'll undergo a detention risk assessment and be released into the custody of his mother. In the digital world, Karen professes her and her son's love for Baker before disappearing, and the digital Baker talks to his son on the phone and tells him he did the right thing in killing Frank. The movie ends with Patrick visiting Baker in the digital world and the two embracing, indicating that Patrick is back home and programmed himself into the game to reunite with his father and go fishing. And that's the movie. So the way I read it, the game that Patrick creates is a means by which he can connect to his father, and by going against the rules that the other characters in the game are trying to enforce upon him, and forgoing his mission to catch the big tuna to instead kill Patrick's stepfather, Baker Dill, or John, is thereby proving his love for his son, giving Patrick the fatherly figure he never truly had, and giving his mother and him the protection that he in the real world had to kill his stepfather for. It's a mouthful. The game also allows Patrick to imagine a world in which his father is still alive and cares about him dearly. The game, and by extension movie, is all about seeking justice, whether it's justice to giant tuna, or justice against an overall terrible person like Frank. So in the end, in short, everything that happens on the island of Plymouth, which is most of the movie, is pure fantasy. It's not real, it's a video game. And if you think this twist has a lot of strange implications, you're definitely not wrong. Like, chief among which is, if Baker is being controlled by his son, then why does his son repeatedly program his father to have sex with Diane Lane for money? And also, when Baker finds out that he's a video game character, he has a bit of an existential crisis, which raises the question of why program your virtual father to have an existential crisis in the first place? What does that really achieve? So, if it all sounds bonkers, that's because it is. Uh, this is 2019's Collateral Beauty, or Book of Henry, a movie where an explanation can't capture the entire picture of craziness that is being spun by director Stephen Knight. It's a disaster, but I once heard that the worst thing a bad movie can be is boring, and I have to give this movie at least some credit, because it's simply not boring. Like, to be totally honest, I, I don't like this movie, but I would totally take it over the more traditional movie that was promised to the audience in the trailers. In mainstream filmmaking, there's a real lack of risk-taking, a tendency to give audiences what they're used to, so seeing a major Hollywood movie with two massive stars that's getting a wide release and, and going against the mold is at least interesting, it's at least memorable, it's not good, and it's pretty problematic in general, but it's memorable, and there's some merit in that. So that is my explanation of Serenity. Did you see this movie? What did you think of it? Um, leave your comments down below. I always like to interact with you guys and hear what you thought of these movies. Um, also, remember to follow me on Twitter, at RealCook. And that's about it. Remember to like this video and subscribe for more movie-related content. I'm Justin Cook, and I'll see you next time.